<laughs> Don't smile, Steve. So I've been thinking about it for at least 30 seconds, and I do not understand how a refrigerator works, Dad, much less the ranking cycle. Well, son, I think it's about time you learned about refrigerators. Thankfully, I have my refrigerator right here. There's four main parts of a refrigerator. This is the compressor. This is the boiler. This piece goes on the inside of the refrigerator, and it's what does the cooling. This little guy over here is the expansion valve. And this is the condenser. This part goes on the back side and gives heat off to the room. Now, son, to explain the way a Rankin cycle works in a refrigerator, we brought in Brian P.V. Priola. The way a refrigerator works is there's a refrigerant, in this case, R134A. And what it does is it starts off at point one as both a liquid and a vapor. When it moves through the boiler, as we saw in the refrigerator before, it becomes all vapor by lowering the pressure causing it to boil, which is also then lowering the temperature of the refrigerator because that's where it's drawing the heat out. Why is the pressure lowered? What does that have to do with boiling? We all know that pressure and temperature are related. When we want to boil water, we boil it at 100 degrees Celsius, but that's at atmospheric pressure. If we lower the pressure, we're actually able to make water boil at a lower temperature. Here's an example. In this example, Mike's going to be representing our refrigerant, R134A, and the two Brian's are going to be representing pressure. At high pressure, with both of us pushing on the box, Mike can't get out. But at lower pressure, with only one of us pushing, he can easily get out. This is analogous to a lower temperature boiling at a lower pressure. Now that we have a better understanding of the relationship between pressure and temperature and the boiling point of a liquid, let's go back to our example and cycle. Initially, the R134A exists as a vapor and a liquid. Then it moves through the boiler, where it becomes a saturated vapor. A saturated vapor is a vapor that is for a specific pressure at the lowest temperature it can be at before it condenses back into a liquid. From here, the R134A moves through the compressor. This takes a saturated vapor and increases both the pressure and the temperature to make it a superheated vapor. A superheated vapor is just a fancy way of saying that the vapor is at a temperature that is higher than the boiling point and is no longer considered saturated. Now, the next step is going to the condenser. If I told you, Mike, that the condenser is the opposite of the boiler, then? I would guess that it dumps heat from the refrigerator to the room and it goes from a superheated vapor to a saturated liquid. If the temperature is raised because it's pressurized, then it's going to be hotter than the room temperature and it can just dissipate all the heat into the room. Coming out of the condenser, the stream is a saturated liquid. Now this is pretty much the same as a saturated vapor, it's just all in the liquid phase. And then this next operation is an expansion valve, which decreases the temperature and the pressure to get the stream to have the same conditions as it originally had. Whenever. Here we have stream 1 to 2, which is going from a liquid vapor mixture to saturated vapor at constant pressure. That corresponds to crossing the boiler, which he said was constant pressure, and is located right here. 
it may not look like more than just a piece of metal, and in fact, that's all it is. The, uh, the refrigerant R134 is going to flow up in here, flows through a series of tubes, and then back out a uh, thinner tube, or actually the larger tube, you can't really tell the difference between, and into the compressor. The next step is to go from a saturated vapor to a superheated vapor. This step raises pressure and temperature, and it's going across the compressor. This is the compressor, and this is the compressor on an actual refrigerator. It, after taking heat from the refrigerator at the boiler, it pressurizes the stream of refrigerant, which is then going to be passed to the condenser. The next step takes the superheated vapor and condenses it to saturated liquid at constant pressure. That step is the condenser. That is also at constant pressure, and again, may not look like more than just metal, and that's really all it is. The fluid passes through here, um, condenses, and then into the valve. The next step is crossing the valve where the saturated liquid goes to a liquid vapor mixture, which is the same mixture that existed in, before we went into the boiler. This lowers the pressure and temperature. After condensing and dumping all the heat that was taken from the refrigerator, passes into the adiabatic valve, which is where the pressure is lowered before it re-enters the boiler and the cycle repeats. In our refrigerator, there's a maximum achievable coefficient of performance, COP, which describes how well the refrigerator is performing. In a Carnot cycle, which is the best case scenario, we have cold temperature, or the temperature inside the fridge, divided by the difference of the hot temperature, the temperature outside the back of the fridge, and the cold temperature. The higher this value is, the better the fridge performs. Contrast that with the real scenario, where you divide your QC, which is the heat leaving the fridge through the boiler, and your shaft work, which is the work that you put into the compressor in order to compress the gas before the condenser. This value will always be less than your ideal case. And it's then, day four and we have and no we, food. Then, as Brian discussed earlier, there's only so much we can do to get close to our ideal case from actuality. Well, if we make the temperatures of the inside and the outside of the fridge closer together, then we can get a better coefficient of performance by reducing the denominator. However, how warm do you really want the inside of the fridge to be? I mean, we can make it one degree lower than the room temperature, but then we're really not refrigerating anything, are we? Another way to look at it is if we better insulate the fridge to stop heat from getting back in. If we do that, then the pump doesn't have to run as long because the refrigerator will stay colder longer. That means we'll be decreasing the work put in the electrical work. If we do that, we'll get a better coefficient performance. Another way to increase the efficiency is to decrease the work put into the compressor to compress the fluid. This can be done by decreasing the exit pressure from the compressor. If you do this, you can't transfer as much heat out of the refrigerator, and so you can't cool it to as low of a temperature. But if you increase the insulation, as Brian talked about before, then you're not getting as much heat flowing into your refrigerator.